Hey everybody, Jonathan Baylor back with another bonus sane show and happy to bring back friend of the show, Alexandra Jameson, to talk about three of my favorite things in the world. Women, food, and desire, which also happens to be the title of her new book. So we got Alexandra Jameson, we got Women, Food, and Desire. What more could you want? Welcome, Alex. How you doing? Oh, thanks, man. It's so good to talk with you. Well, Alex, when I heard the title of your new book, Women, Food, and Desire, first of all, whoever came up with that, kudos. Uh, <laughs> I Thank be, you. There it is. There it is. And what? Tell me about. I mean, this is this is not you know how to lose ten pounds in ten days. This is Women, Food, and Desire. What is this all about? Yeah, you know, the the food is about learning to embrace your cravings and make peace with food and really reclaim your body. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, you and I have been in the helping people heal their bodies with food business mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for a while. I've been doing this for about 15 years. And the nutritional information, it's always changing, it's always growing, we're always learning new things about how to heal our bodies you know, the microbiome, thank goodness, is finally getting its time in the sun. This is foundational to our physical health, but we are emotional beings as well. We can't just look at, well, what are the inputs of my body? You know, what am I eating? So many people have tried that for years to change what they're eating and just focus on the nutritional or physical aspect. There is also this emotional aspect. And the sensual aspect of food and we have to bring those two things together for a person to finally find real health and vitality learning to love food and love the foods that are going to help them feel great and also just love their bodies where they are so this whole book really came out of my whole cravings struggle and so mm. many of my clients struggle with their own cravings and i thought there's more to this than just you know, breaking it down into calories or into the macronutrients. And that's why I loved your book so much because like, yes, stop with the calorie counting. It doesn't help anyone, right? Absolutely. Well, and what, when you say your cravings, I know you have a very unique story. So can you tell us a little bit about the, the personal uh, plight that led to this book? So I was vegan for over a decade. Mm. You may remember the movie Super Size Me. Mm -hmm. uh, my ex Morgan and I created and filmed the movie Super Size Me together. And in that film, you know, we examined the fast food industry and the fast food diet that's killing so many Americans. And I was the vegan chef girlfriend in the film. You know, that was that was my life. That's who I was. And after Super Size Me came out, I wrote three books on vegan cooking and nutrition and coached a lot of people, omnivores, carnivores, you know, whoever wanted to come to me and get help finding their best diet. I worked with everyone, but vegan was my thing. Mm -hmm. And in my mid thirties, you know, I've been vegan for over 10 years now, suddenly in my mid thirties, my body starts to break down mm. and I start having shorter and shorter menstrual cycles, you know, every 14, 16 days exhausted all the time. My hair, skin, and nails just not looking good. It was like I was aging before mm. my eyes. And I started craving meat. Mm. This was bad. This was <laughs> not good. This was not in the plan. I, had, I was totally identified as vegan. Many of my friends were vegan. And I tried everything in the vegan framework to fix my body. Mm -hmm. You know, more superfoods, more plant-based protein, more sea vegetables, and nothing was working. Mm -hmm. And I realized that these cravings for meat were my body telling me, you need something else. Mm -hmm. And I was counseling clients, my readers, to listen to their cravings. Listen to your body. It's telling you what you need if you can listen to the subtle messages. And I wasn't allowing myself that same freedom. So with some support from some some friends, and it took a little time for me to really come to terms with this, but I started eating animal products. You know, I started mm -hmm. with organic eggs and then some fish, and my body felt so good physically, mm -hmm. but emotionally it was very challenging to come to terms with kind of switching my identity in full view of, you know, 20,000 readers who read my newsletters every week. So... 
it's, I understand how hard it is to really admit what it is you want, not just in your body, but in your life, because mm -hmm. we're so afraid of the backlash. And, mm -hmm. and that's what I experienced. You know, I came out as no longer vegan and it went totally viral. Thousands and thousands of comments, Facebook posts, really vicious attacks online, death threats, actual friends unfriending me. Um, so I, I know how challenging it is to try to explore your health and your diet and be scared that you're going to be ostracized from the people that you love. Alex, is that something, uh, certainly I would imagine that, that most, if not all of the readers of your book will, will not be experiencing something as severe as what you experienced, but I think we can all, we all know that anytime we make any change in our lifestyle, and sadly, especially the ones that are for the positive, just objectively for the positive, like I'm going to go back to school or I'm right. going to stop smoking, some subset of your peer group is going to, is going to harass you for that. Right. How, will we learn how to deal with that a little bit in your new book? Absolutely. And it's a, it's a process to gain that confidence and to start looking for the support that you need because we are social creatures mm. you know we are we are we crave intimacy as much as we crave sugar in fact <laughs> i think that's one of the main reasons why we crave sugar is yeah. because we're not getting enough intimacy that's all that's chapter eight <laughs> chapter eight is all about intimacy and sexual pleasures and and those aspects of our health too but humans are social creatures and to be ostracized cut out from your tribe is like death yeah. for us. It really strikes us on that basic fear level. Mm -hmm. So I, I do talk in the book, you know, I recount stories from clients of mine who go through these changes, who have to stand up for themselves, be confident, you know, find other support in their lives. And it's really inspiring what you're able to create. Do you find, so it's already hard so that we can almost break this apart into let's let's almost say um, physiological and psychological and you use sugar, which is a great example. So the more and more research we see, the more and more we see that the physiological grip that processed sugar has on us is is no less severe than that of things like even nicotine or other type addictive drugs. But when you combine with that the the social ostracism. So if you choose not to smoke or if someone offers you a cigarette and you say, that's OK, I'm not a smoker. People are gonna be like, well, well, this guy doesn't smoke cigarettes, clearly. Right. Think, but right. if you say, uh, you know, I brought cupcakes in, I, you know, I'm not gonna have any cupcakes. People are like, wow. So not only do we have this addictive substance, which is already hard enough to get rid of, but then society seems to uh, encourage us not to get rid of it. So we've got like a double whammy. How, how can we escape that? I so resonate with that story, <laughs> man. When I first changed my diet. To, and I had to cut out sugar to rebalance my own bacteria in my mm -hmm. body. You know, I had to cut out sugar. And like two months later, it was my birthday in the mm -hmm. office where I was working. And everybody looks forward to birthdays in the office, right? The HR director gets a cake. <laughs> and I went to her and I said, Please, you know, don't get a cake for me. I'm not going to eat it. I'm off sugar. And the dirty looks <laughs> I got yeah. because I had said no cake, please like people were pissed that they weren't getting their free cake in the office right so it was really challenging it was like oh i'm sorry like i i took away the party like can we get a bowl of fruit instead and people just weren't very psyched about that but <laughs> so yeah i've been there for sure and in the book i really break down what i see are the the four root causes of cravings mm. you know from the microscopic level the bacterial cravings are nutritional cravings emotional and physical cravings mm. and you know the bacterial balance in our body absolutely has to do with what we crave mm. so my first cravings drama around this sugar addiction i had in my mid-20s was absolutely about a candida overgrowth. Mm. So those cravings for sugar were telling me something. It wasn't necessarily that I should have what I was craving at that mm. point, but I had to learn, oh, this craving means that there is something else in my body. You know, it was the puppet master. It was the beast within that was telling me I had to eat sugar to feed it. But then there are nutritional cravings and you know, our, thank goodness we have nutritional cravings. It's what drives us to eat, it's appetite. But we can often crave foods that actually have the minerals and nutrients in them that we need. Mm -hmm. You know, magnesium deficiency is one of the top most concerns for American women. 
guess which food has a great amount of magnesium in it that we love so much? Chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> so I teach people how to like look for the magnesium rich foods that they can start integrating like hemp seeds, like chia seeds. Like if you start adding those in every day, your chocolate cravings will reduce because mm -hmm. you're getting the magnesium that you need. Mm -hmm. And then there's the emotional cravings. You know, I had a long ongoing threesome love affair with Ben and Jerry's on my couch <laughs> because I was lonely. Mm -hmm. I was, you know, my marriage dissolved. I was now alone. And that nine to 11 o'clock at night on the couch by myself was just too lonely to face by myself. So, yeah. you know, hanging out with Ben and Jerry made me feel a little bit more comfortable. Yeah. We, we are emotional beings. You know, people come to me and they say, I have an emotional eating problem. Like we are all emotional eaters. Nobody makes a food decision without emotion somehow involved in it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then finally, those physical cravings. We are, we are physical animals. We love to move. You know, when you, if you've been an athlete ever growing up, or if you did dance, or if you just love to play, like that was your body telling you you're alive. So we crave movement and we crave physical intimacy with mm -hmm. other people. But there's so much keeping us from enjoying that or doing that on a regular basis. So learning how to call exercise movement instead of a workout <laughs> is a lot more fun for people. You know, I spent $300 this summer on hot pink roller skates. <laughs> best exercise of my life and so fun. It's like one of my favorite things to do. So, you know, I really try to get people to look at all the aspects that are eliciting cravings mm -hmm. in their body, heal themselves with food while they're healing their relationship with food. Looking deep within is such a critical thing to do. And I'm hoping, Alex, that you could provide some insight into this. It's very easy for people to just hear, uh, listen to your body. And, and they're like, oh, yeah, listen to my body. Well, my body's saying, eat some cookies. Uh, a, a bit like, you know, if a heroin addict listened to their body, uh, the heroin addict would probably not end up in a very good place. So how do we, uh, who have been so subjugated by a society that just pummels us with things that literally overtake healthy cravings and make us literally crave more of that which is killing us, Mm -hmm. How do we how do we listen to our body, but then almost like listen to it and realize we shouldn't be listening to it, and then when we should be listening to it later, how do, how do we do that? <laughs> right. How do we do that? Well, uh, the sugar addict or the drug addict who is aware that they have a problem mm -hmm. and that they need to do something to stop this addiction that's killing them. Mm -hmm. You know, I can only I can only talk with someone who's at that place, right? Mm. I can't convince someone who's like, no, I don't have a problem, right? They're they're not in this conversation with me. But someone who is aware, like, I am craving sugar all the time and it's killing me. Yeah. Like it is definitely, you know, depleting my life vitality. It is getting in the way of me having energy to be with my family. It is keeping me from contributing to, you know, some great project that I want to create. So someone who's aware of what the craving is doing to them, they know that they're ready to heal. Yeah. They know that they need help healing their body with food. Hmm. When you start to heal the body and those things balance out, the bacteria, the nutritional, those things start to get to a healthy place. That's when you start to hear the quieter whispers mm. from your body. You know, a lot of our cravings, you know, I, the, the women who come to me are like, I am so busy. I am so crazy overworked. I don't give myself the rest, the fun, the relaxation that I need. So that mocha frappuccino latte at three o'clock is like my savior, yeah. right? That's because we we are so out of connection with our bodies. We don't hear the quieter whispers for sleep, for creativity, for play, for you know relaxation, for intimacy. So that our bodies have to start screaming at us, have the mocha if you won't sleep and have any fun, okay? Like something. So we have to learn to like tune into the whispers. My clients call me the cravings whisperer because you really have to like go in there and start healing like, us heal, 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 but really listen. What is it that you really desire? That that whisper analogy really resonates with me, Alex, because I think 
there there is this innate wisdom that is within each of us but when that wisdom comes to us maybe best example I can come up with <clears throat> my mother used to tell me Jonathan if you have to think about it chances are you shouldn't do it you know it's like one of those things where it's like I well, should I do this and like the act like there is something in your voice whispering you know you shouldn't do this but mm -hmm. it's a whisper but it's right. always a whisper. It's like that, the conscious, that which is innately good in us. It's always either like that, almost that calm sage, which is just like, you know, the right answer. Come on. Oh, that's so good. Whereas the other, say... the, the marketer is like, oh, do it now, right now. Oh. <laughs> the marketer. I love it. I, that's so true. Your mother, what a wise woman. That's brilliant. I always say like thinking, overthinking things never did me any good. Like really doesn't do me any good. And actually that is an aspect that I talk about in the book, the, the bacterial, the gut health aspect of healing and cravings is so tied with intuition mm. you know our gut is our feeling brain it's our intuitive brain you get nervous knots you get a gut feeling about something you know you get butterflies in your stomach we feel the truth mm -hmm. in our gut mm -hmm. our it, it's incredible science is finally catching up to these old old sayings right yeah. but if your gut is overpopulated with the bad bacteria or you have leaky gut or you have celiac and you're still eating gluten, your ability, you, your intuitive brain is damaged. Mm. Your intuitive brain is cloudy and it can't see and feel. So healing that part of your body is like the foundational place to start for real health. Mm. And have you found a lot, I know you do counseling, have you found that people have, how critical is getting literal support from another person or from a group of people with doing this because i know for like my father is an addictions counselor professionally that's what he does and and having group sessions if you look at for example alcoholics anonymous one of the most successful addictions programs and it's it's incredibly social and it's incredibly not you locking yourself in a dark room and just gritting your teeth and trying to fight through it is that similar here with food and these types of things it is it's so important that's why you know i run group cleanses four or five times a year mm. on the internet, bringing people together from all over the world. Mm. And you f start to feel the energy within the first call of people so relieved to have someone else mm. who's mirroring their experience, who supports them in this struggle, because we are as connected as we are, we are so disconnected. You know, we may be living in a town where there is nobody else who thinks like us, <laughs> who is not trying to go to the health food store, <laughs> or you know, exploring a different way of eating, you may be the only one in your family who's like, this way of living is killing us. Yeah. How, doing it alone is near to impossible. You either have to move or find an online community or someone nearby who's really gonna support you and be there for you. And it's interesting, I'm, I'm actually studying positive psychology now. You were just saying going back to school, mm -hmm. like lifelong learner here, can't <laughs> stop myself. So I'm getting certified in positive psychology and one of the things that, like the main feature that separates a really happy person, a successful happy person in life from someone who is totally <coughs> unhappy in life is positive social connections. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And when you are happy and you feel positive and you have a group to get support from, you're much more likely to stick with any health plan that you think is gonna help your body. And that shows such a sharp contrast to, just, I mean, like, I think we hear that and we'll all say, of course, but hold on a second. How many times have all of us who are, are listening to this or watching this just said, just use more willpower? Like what you talked about being with people, being in a group of people, getting social support, that if willpower is one dimension of this, like that is a whole different dimension. And you'll actually find like, if you need a lot of willpower, it seems like that might be an indication that you, you're not going about this in the healthiest way possible because health and vitality, as, as you talk about, it, it is actually enjoyable. And if you find the right environment in which to cultivate this lifestyle, you shouldn't be like, Ugh! I mean, it should be an enjoyment, right? <laughs> It should, absolutely. And I, I love that you brought up willpower because I, I actually go into willpower and habit in the book quite mm. a bit, talking about how our brains work because your diet is not just about feeding your body different foods. It's about learning to shift your mindset. 
And we do beat up on ourselves so vigorously when we think we're weak. We think we've failed. We just think we don't have the willpower. Well, you have a finite amount of willpower every day and every decision you make depletes your willpower every time you make that choice. Every time you make a choice, your willpower goes down a little bit. You know what enables you to strengthen your willpower? One of the many things I talk about is having support. It's having people in your life you can rely on who take some of the pressure off. So many of us, myself included, I can be guilty of super mom syndrome, like trying to do it all, run the business, take care of the kid, all that at the same time. We need each other. We need each other to make this doable. You know, I, my partner Bob and I talk all the time about how he is like the best support person to ever do a cleanse because he know, he's done it himself and he knows what I need. I need him to do the dishes more often. I need him to take care of the little details because my willpower is going to be a little low. You know, my brain sugar is going down a little bit. <laughs> so I need that support and yeah. he's really good with that. But what if you don't have a partner at home who's supportive? That's what we talk about. Well, Alex, I think this is a great contribution to the community because I, I've been personally, I've been so involved in the science and I've seen how far pure science can take you. And it's, I have a little bit of a double whammy because my formal education is in economics and economists are are known for thinking of people as what's called econs, which are these purely rational beings that just make, well, clearly this has more vitamin C in it, so I'm going to eat it because vitamin C is good for me. And the more you live, the more you see that, nope, that's not how people work. And we can have all the science in the world, but if we don't look at all the other aspects that are involved in this. It's not going to matter a hill of beans. So uh, tell us a little bit more about where we can find this book, when we can find it, and, and just maybe what you hope people will get from it. Oh, man, I'm so excited. So Women, Food, and Desire. I'm going to flash the cover. Boom! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Women, Food, and Desire is coming out January 6th. And we are actually going to be offering a free cravings cookbook mm. for anyone, whether you buy the book or not. Um, we want to, I want to give you a bunch of recipes, dozens of recipes that are going to answer those cravings that you always have, but in such a healthful, easy, delicious way that you actually start healing your body while you get the taste and flavor and experience that you want from food. So this cravings cookbook is going to be awesome and people can sign up and get that for free online. I love it. I love it. Well, and where can folks go online to learn more about the uh, book Women, Food, and Desire? <laughs> so they can go to womenfoodanddesire.com. And be very careful maybe to go directly to that URL and not to just type into Google Women, Food, Desire, because you might get some much different search results if you just type that in. <laughs> Which might be exciting, which, which, but they won't get you the cookbook. If you're at work, you might just... <laughs> so womenfoodanddesire.com. I love it. Well... Alex, it's always a pleasure chatting with you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Me too. Thank you, man. Well, viewers and listeners, I hope you enjoyed this chat as much as I did. Our delightful guest today is friend of the show, Alexandra Jameson. The name of her new book is Women, Food, and Desire. Check it out at womenfoodanddesire.com and check your inbox because I will be sure to send you a link to the wonderful free cookbook she mentioned. And remember, this week and every week after, stay sane. Chat with you soon.